Well, while Elon Musk was focusing on Europe, where he opened his fourth gigafactory in Germany this week, some members of Congress want to look deeper into the exposure of Elon Musk, specifically SpaceX, to the Chinese government. Representative Chris Stewart, a Republican from Utah, is calling on the National Reconnaissance Office to provide Congress with briefings on whether or not there are financial entanglements with China. Uh, Congressman Stewart, thanks so much for joining us now live. You know, you've made it clear that you are a fan of Elon Musk. So walk us through exactly what you're you're looking into here. Yeah, you know, I really am. He he's done some incredibly uh, innovative technologies. That some of the uh, some of the areas he's gone that people thought, well, that's just not possible. He's proven he's proven them wrong. And I, I, again, to use your words, I'm a big fan of his, uh, and especially the downward pressure he's exerted, say, in the launch market, something that's very very important to our own national security and very very expensive. But because he has these ex exquisite technologies, because he is on the leading edge of some of these things, not only in space but in battery tech technology and in, in autonomy, two really critical factors to, I think, our future national security, but also the future security of our own economies. We just wanna make sure that there's not technology transfer taking place there that we wouldn't want to have happen. And look, we understand how malicious, how pervasive, how just determined Chinese uh, uh, operations are in regard to capturing as much of this technology as they can in any way that they can. So it would be reasonable for us to want to be uh, assured and want to be secure in and know what uh, Elon Musk's companies and what their relationships with China might be. Congressman, it's Akiko here. I wonder how much of your concern is very specific to space technology. We have seen investigations in the past about data sharing that happens in Chinese apps, for example. Um, how wide spread or, or how big of a scope are you looking to take into this specific issue? Yeah, you know, uh, we don't know the answer to that yet. And one thing I want to be clear about as well is we have no reason to believe that there's anything malicious taking place here. We don't think that SpaceX wants or would in any way would deliberately share their technology. And in fact, they've been a, a good uh, a good U.S. citizen here. We know that there were some efforts by Chinese operatives to gain access to SpaceX. So they wanted to be some investors. They tried to do that through third parties so that it wouldn't be obvious who they were. When SpaceX leadership became aware of that, they turned that back. They said, no, we're not interested in doing that. So we're, we're very pleased with the efforts that they've taken up to this point. But we also know, as I said, we know how determined Chinese operatives and intelligence can be. And we know that they can mask many times their intentions, the parties that are involved, and they're very, very effective at coming in through back doors, so to speak. So we just feel like it's prudent to try to understand and for the NRO to make certain that there aren't uh, technology transfers, particularly on the launch side. Although I don't think we can minimize the technologies in, in batteries and in, again, innovative technologies regarding autonomy. Those are also important. Although our focus in initially with the NRO will be on the launch and the space side. Uh, Congressman, I guess kind of a simple question here. Why call in the National Reconnaissance Office instead of uh, SpaceX or Elon Musk directly? Yeah, well, and we've had conversations with them and, and we've been satisfied with those conversations to date. But NRO, of course, is a third party. They're the ones that have exquisite insight into not just launch, but in the technologies of some of the satellites and and the, and the actual vehicles and machinery that we're putting in space. And so we feel like they have access and they have some insights that would be valuable to us that, uh, you know, in some cases, even the, even the private contractors may be unaware of. So they're a pretty good referee and have, a, a, again, a lot of insights that we, we just hope to take advantage of. And specifically, I mean, what happens if you do find, as you've described it, entanglements with the Chinese government mm -hmm. that raises red flags for you? I mean, we've seen uh, Congress, for example, take action through the Forced Labor Prevention Act, which essentially says companies cannot source from a place like Xinjiang. I mean, do you see a way to address these concerns through legislation or something else? Well, and, and hopefully we wouldn't have to do legislation because we know how long that would take. And there would be great urgency if we were discovered that there were entanglements. Once again, I don't think that there are. The evidence isn't, isn't uh, indicating that we, uh, that we have great concerns there, but we have to be persistent in, in our oversight. 
and in our expectation that China is going to do everything they can, and they're not going to try once and just give up. They're going to try again and again and again. So we need to be constantly alert and constantly aware. That's what this effort is about. Now, to your question, well, what would we do? It would depend an awful lot on what those entanglements or what those relationships were. Uh, but we think that there's a framework already in place that would that would allow us to deal with that. And honestly, I don't think SpaceX would be difficult to work with. They don't want those entanglements. They don't want those types of technology transfers. And I think they would be very willing to work with the U.S. government in order to, if those were discovered, in order to sever those relationships. Uh, Congressman, I want to put that issue to the side here and just kind of talking about uh, an issue that I'm sure is uh, pressing for every single district around the country, and that is, of course, inflation. We know energy prices specifically have been definitely hurting Americans. Uh, what are you seeing in your district in Utah? Uh, what are constituents telling you about inflation? We know that there's been warnings from the Biden administration that this whole Russia-Ukraine conflict uh, could further exacerbate prices. Well, they are going to exacerbate prices. There's no doubt about that. But they're also asking the American people to have a memory of only two weeks because they're saying that all of this inflation, especially in, in energy, as, you, as you've said, is due to Vladimir Putin and due to the war in Ukraine. And of course, that's nonsense. That's not true. We know that's not true. The American people know that's not true. They know the steps that the Biden administration took to confine and to restrict American oil and gas exploration and development. That's taken place for 15 months now. And look, if you if you live in the city and you're and you're well to do and someone picks you up in a car and you haven't filled up a gas tank yourself in a long time, you don't worry so much about the price of gas being five dollars or more. But if you're a young family like my kids, for example, who are just starting their careers, they have young children. It's a big deal to them. It's a big deal to people on fixed incomes, to, for people living on Social Security, for example. It's a big deal for our working poor. And you just can't minimize how regressive this is, the impacts this has on the poorest among us. And it's not just fuel, it's across the board, but particularly the things that most of us need, fuel, housing, and food. Those are the ones that we've seen the, 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 the most exaggerated uh, impacts on, on inflation. And those are the things that people need for just survival and it's, Look, it's it's an enormous stress on American families, and the administration has got to recognize it in ways that they just haven't been willing to at this point. Uh, Congressman, it's worth pointing out that you've got close ties to the oil and gas industry, obviously big donors to your campaigns in the past. There, this, there is a debate right now that's happening about whether, in fact, it needs to be one or the other, more drilling or more renewable energy. And we heard from Energy Secretary yeah. Jennifer Granholm this morning at the IEA ministerial meeting saying, this is not about one or the other. It can be binary. Two sides can move together. Do you agree? Yeah, I do. And, and my record indicates that. And, and by the way, you indicate that I have ties to oil and gas. I do. Well, that's because they're here in the state. They're an important part of our economy. I want to support that. And as I've indicated already, it's important for the American economy and for the American people to have as inexpensive fuel as, and energy as we can. But I, I have also, for example, I led the way to, to allow for development of solar and wind on federal lands. That's one of the first initiatives I took on in Congress. So I'm very proud to take you a place in the central part of my district where you can climb up on top of these enormous uh, windmills. I can point to you from there, a solar farm that was produced on federal lands that we cleared the way for. We've got uh, $500 million in funding to the University of Utah for geothermal exploration and development. They will be one of the leading uh, technology and research centers in geothermal in the entire world because of that. So I agree with, with the secretary and with what you just proposed. It doesn't have to be one or the other. We should move toward green energy as much as we can. But in the interim, we can't turn away from the absolute necessity now of carbon-based fuels while we try to develop some of these other opportunities. Congressman Chris Stewart uh, joining us from Utah this morning. Really appreciate the time.